Welcome everybody. My name is Daryl Henry. I'm the executive director of the Western Caucus Foundation. 50 years ago today, the Vietnam War was still ongoing. Richard Nixon was president and the Watergate hearings had just begun. The first mobile phone was invented. And Joe Biden was sworn in as a United States Senator at the age of 30. And on December 28, 1973, the Endangered Species Act was signed into law. The ESA's 50th anniversary, and for decades, ESA advocates have argued that conservation is a slow process and needs time to work. So at this half century mark, we are taking this opportunity to look into the ESA's true conservation. Looking at the record, lay the groundwork for more informed decision about the next steps for the act. Thus, the Western Caucus has initiated a study to produce a comprehensive, well-documented 50th anniversary report to assess the law's actual conservation record. Today, we present a report, the Endangered Species Act at 50, a record of falsified recoveries that underscore a lack of scientific integrity in the federal program. But before we get into that, I'd like to introduce our Western Caucus Foundation, two honorary co-chairs. From Wyoming, Senator Cynthia Lemus, Chair of the Senate Western Caucus, and Representative Dan Newhouse from Washington's 4th District. Um, they will open up, and he's also Chairman of the Congressional Western Caucus, and they will open up with a few remarks. So, Senator Lemus. Thanks so much, Gerald. Um, this is a really busy day on Capitol Hill, so I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, this report uh, should be a wake up call. Uh, we all know that. The Endangered Species Act is broken. We know it's been broken for a long time. We know that the original goals of the ESA were to recover species. Uh, today's goal is to get them listed and leave them listed so people can raise money off charismatic megafauna. And uh, it's time to draw attention to the failures of the Endangered Species Act and the drift from its original purpose. So I really want to thank Rob Gordon. He's an expert in the Endangered Species Act. He spent a lot of years at the Department of the Interior seeing firsthand how this law is being implemented. And uh, this, uh, this report is just a big red flag uh, to uh, errors uh, uh, some intentional and some unintentional. I hope some unintentional because uh, it is a sort of a glaring indictment uh, of an act we need to pay more attention to. So 50 years of data and history uh, have pointed out that although the goals of ESA are laudable, the practice uh, needs to be reformed. Uh, so as, as chair of the Senate Western Caucus and also a member of the Environment and Public Works Committee in the Senate, uh, where I'm the lead Republican on the uh, ESA committee, the one on uh, fish and water uh, and wildlife, we, we've just got to roll up our sleeves and make more people aware of this. Um, so we've had a few successes in the Senate. Um, I had sponsored a Congressional Review Act that was uh, that passed the Senate to repeal the Fish and Wildlife Services rule that designated huge, huge swaths of public and private land as critical habitat. And the reason it passed is because we got a Democrat, or rather an independent, to go with us, Angus King. And he went with us because almost the entire state of Maine was designated as critical habitat. So even even people of the other party are seeing uh, the abuses that uh, are sometimes created by uh, those who are trying to implement this law. So uh, it, it is absolutely critical that uh, this report uh, receive our attention and that we in turn share it with others so people people can understand the effects and we can right this ship. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased, Rob, thank you so much for doing it. And now I would like to ask uh, my house colleague, Dan Newhouse is just doing a wonderful job over in the house and so proud to serve with you and uh, uh, to follow your lead on, on so many important and critical issues. Uh, also my compliments to the tremendous growth that the House Western Caucus has enjoyed. My gosh, you have members from 
almost every state now. It's it's a uh, truly impressive organization, a, a huge and now powerful and influential caucus, uh, and its growth um, is a testament to the good work they're doing in the House. Let's all welcome Dan Newhouse. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I was going to let you go on and on as long as you wanted to. <laughs> but uh, appreciate all of you joining us today. Daryl, thanks for that trip down memory lane. My gosh. I'm, not all of you remember all of those things. Unfortunately, I do. I remember. Um, but this is uh, the year we're marking the 50th anniversary, as you know, of the ESA, the Endangered Species Act. And I got to say, and I hate to say it this way, but it's truly been an unremarkable, uh, disappointing, 50 years by almost any metric you can imagine. Um, you all know that less than 5% of any species that have been, ever been placed on the list have ever come off. Um, but that, and that just shows that it's not working for those, those species that we're, we're, we're intended to help. Um, and I didn't know this, and probably some of you did, but Rob, thank you for, for exposing this. Even that number 5% is misleading. The, 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 the report details much erroneous data and analysis that have been used to literally inflate the numbers, inflate the number of species that have been recovered and give the, that credit to the ESA. And that's really concerning. So we obviously need more transparency um, over this delisting or, and listing process. Uh, my hope is uh, through that, this hard work, uh, this will help us as um, Bruce Westerman, the chairman of the House Natural Re Resources Committee and I have put together a working group on reforming the ESA. So hope to work hand in hand with you, Senator Lummis in the Senate to uh, really bring some needed reform to the, this ESA so that the next 50 years, our, our successors can stand up at, at these podiums and chairs and, and celebrate true success, that we're actually doing the things that are required to get species recovered and off the list. So thanks to the foundation, the Western Caucus Foundation, Daryl for commissioning this report. Thanks to Rob Gordon for um, all of the work and the resource, research that you've put into this and uh, looking forward to, like I said, many good things to come as a result of this hard work. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Senator Lemus, Representative Dan Newhouse. <clears throat> There's broad consensus behind the intent of the ESA to conserve species, to take them off the list. Thus, that is the metric of this study. And it's to be expected that certain interests will characterize this report as a threat to the Endangered Species Act or an attempt to roll back environmental regulations. Attempts to modernize the ESA have met with stiff resistance in the past and critics of the act shun uh, shunned. It's only in the environmental arena that any effort to bring a program into the future, or much less even the present, to make it more difficult, um, to make it more difficult is to call it a rollback. So now let me bring up the report author and noted ESA expert Rob Gordon to walk you through the findings. Thank you, Tara. I've got a little clock here, which I'm going to need because I like to talk about this stuff. So I know I could drown you. Um, this is something I have plowed a lot of hours into. And there's no way I'm going to be able to cover right now uh, everything that's in the report. So I'm going to try and give you kind of a 50,000 foot overview, but uh, that, that includes some of the most important points. At the bottom, you know, you've seen that you've heard the title, and um, I'm kind of juxtaposed that with a recent statement by the Fish and Wildlife Service, and you see about in the middle, it says, thus far more than 100 species of plants and animals uh, have been delisted uh, as recovered or reclassified from endangered to threatened based on improved conservation. We would hope that would be the truth. And even if, if that was the case, it wouldn't necessarily be a huge number after 50 years. 
but it's it's not accurate. It's just not even close to accurate. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, after a half century, 36 of 62 species that have been removed from the list as having recovered really are mistakes. They owe their removal to the list to erroneous data. They were undercounted, the threats were overestimated, they turned out to be an invalid taxon. Uh, if you continue on and you look at the species that are now proposed for delisting, uh, they're also in the report. Uh, at least five of the 12 that have been formally proposed to be removed are similar. Uh, they also uh, really owe their proposed recovery uh, to data error. If you look at the other species, uh, in the quote that I cited, the Fish and Wildlife Service said, you know, there's, uh, there's 100 species, a big portion of them had been downlisted showing improvement. Well, really about half uh, of roughly 40 species that have been, that have been downlisted, for half of them, uh, it is again the result of erroneous data. Undercounting, their ranges are much greater than was believed, uh, the threats were overestimated, the taxon is invalid, uh, just mis mistake after mistake. So, so much so that there are more than twice as many species that were removed as data errors or falsely claimed as recovered than there are species that actually removed, were removed from the list and actually recovered. If we could go to the next slide. So I'm just a, I know this is a, the rest are all pictures. It's a lot too many, a lot of words, but I'll go through it quickly. Um, the top part's the important part, uh, and it, it gives you the definition in the act of conservation, which is basically uh, putting a, a species on a list and recovering it to the point uh, at which the measures provided pursuant to this act are no longer required, right? So in a nutshell, under the ESA, endangered and threatened species are identified, then they're listed, then recovery actions are implemented, and then when that process is completed, the species recovered and it's removed from the list. This is why it's kind of the ultimate measure of whether the act is working or not. Uh, today, there are 1,668, I think that, uh, I checked that yesterday on Fish and Wildlife's uh, ECOS website, I think it might actually be, might be one up that may be missing the wolverine. <clears throat> but, so that's the number on, there's, there are, there's a much smaller number that are off. There are three ways a species can come off the list. It can be recovered, as we've discussed, it can have gone extinct, uh, or it can be recognized that the species was added to the list in error, what the service often calls new information, uh, previously called it data error. Um, and as of yesterday, I downloaded the Fish and Wildlife Service report for delisted species, and I had to add a few to it. Uh, but you, you have 32 domestic extinctions, <clears throat> That doesn't include something called the Choro shoulder band snail. Uh, it was, you know, it's actually not extinct, but it, it, it should be down in the uh, data errors category. But when it was added to the list, the Fish and Wildlife Service thought it was extinct. And subsequently, uh, the agency has stated that, you know, there are enough of these Choro shoulder band snails that they're not going to regulate it. Um, they didn't actually officially remove it from the list. They just issued a position paper saying we're not regulating this thing anymore. 20 domestic data errors. And um, when I downloaded the Fish and Wildlife Service list, it didn't include those two others that I've added, the Tumamuk glowberry and a plant. Uh, and next to both of them are the dates of the final rules removing them. And then what we're here to talk about, the 62 recovered species. And if you were to download the list, you'd see 61. I added one, uh, a plant that called the Cumberland Sandwort, which for some reason didn't show up on the ECOS database uh, and was delisted in uh, August of, of 21. So let's take a look at these 62. 
there are some of them that legitimately recovered. Uh, for example, in the top left, you see a plant, Robin Sinkfoil, found in New Hampshire. Um, it's in a national forest area. Some of the plants were dug up and transplanted to a safer location. A hiking trail was rerouted. Uh, I think those are the most significant actions that were taken with regard to this plant, and it was declared recovered and removed. Uh, the magazine Mountain Chagrin, a, a snail in Arkansas, uh, was removed after the Army agreed that it was not going to conduct uh, maneuvers in a specific area. Uh, there wasn't, to my knowledge, really a change in the number or range of the species, but just the removal of the potential threat of Army training. There are other species, uh, as in the upper left, the Arctic, Arctic peregrine falcon, that have actually increased in number substantially, but that increase isn't really attributable to the ESA. Pretty much any of the experts you talk to uh, on the peregrine falcon, Arctic peregrine falcon, will tell you that that recovery was attributable to the ban on DDT that uh, preceded and was unrelated to the ESA. Or, for example, the gray whale. And, and there are, uh, I think, three other whales listed as having recovered uh, <clears throat> all humpback uh, populations. But they really owe their recovery more to the, the, that commercial whaling declined, and they started to rebound. And then, uh, secondarily, to international whaling agreements, but not the ESA. So I'm not saying there are no recoveries. There are just few, and some of them aren't that impressive. So let's go to the next page. So what, I'm, what the report really focuses on are species that are misleadingly, uh, you know, they're, they're data errors, but they're misleadingly labeled as recoveries. And this has been a practice of the Fish and Wildlife Service going back nearly four decades. You see at the top, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service itself uh, basically acknowledged in the rule removing the pelican uh, that the pelican population population that went from Florida up to North Carolina uh, that you know if we'd known uh, now when we're delisting it what we had known when we put it on the list we probably wouldn't have put it on the list so whatever change wasn't wasn't such a substantial change in the condition of the species that it was removed, it was that, you know, new information uh, became av available, i.e., the thing was never really endangered. Similarly, in 1987, the National Wildlife Federation um, looked at, had, wrote an article on the alligator uh, where they said the familiar and gratifying recovery story of the alligator is mostly wrong. Again, uh, the alligators had been undercounted uh, all the, the alligators that had declined in number were kind of at the periphery of the alligators range in marginally important ecological areas. And I believe also there were things about alligator population dynamics that weren't understood, uh, including I, I think that uh, alligators may double clutch, have two, two sets of offspring when their density is low. And then in 1988, the GAO, uh, said that uh, three different birds that were uh, are endemic to uh, what was then a trust territory, Palau, uh, really owed their uh, official recovery uh, to the discovery of more birds. Again, this is something that should have been, these birds are something that should have been taken off and removed on the basis of data error, not recovery. And I'm not the only one who said this. Other people said this long ago, including the service, including the GAO, and even the National Wildlife Federation. But this is not when the practice stopped. It has continued for about four decades. So let's go to the next slide. The report goes through and addresses 36 of these 62 cases. I'm not gonna possibly be able to go through all of them, and I'm sure you would all have left if I endeavored to do so, so I'm gonna try and quickly touch upon some cases. Hoover's Woolly Star is one of the most dramatic. It's a plant that occurs in California, and when it was added to the list, the Fish and Wildlife Service said that uh, the plant was endangered by agricultural activities, oil and gas activities, um, 
and off-road vehicle use. It subsequently discovered that <clears throat> that wasn't really the case. It would uh, recolonize oil pads and under oil pipelines that uh, actually in some respects the plant did better in areas that were grazed and that uh, it even grew uh, where some off-road vehicle use occurred. So, you know, the threats really weren't there. More importantly, they found that this plant was in a lot of places they didn't believe. It occurred at higher altitudes, it occurred way beyond the area that was believed to be its range, and after a heavy rain, heavy rain in one of four metapopulations, groupings of smaller populations, but in one of four of them, 135 million uh, Hoover's woolly stars were counted. And, you know, in nobody's book, is something that numbers uh, 135 million uh, possibly endangered. But it was declared recovered in 2003. Interesting, inter interestingly, when uh, the service put out its proposed rule to remove it, it was going to do so on the basis of data error. It fully recognized that the real reason the species coming off the list was that the analysis uh, or the data used in that analysis was wrong. And uh, somehow, uh, between the proposed and final rule, it turned into a recovery in 2003. 2011, you have another case. This is uh, a plant called the McGuire Daisy. And you'll see there's a quote that comes from a Fish and Wildlife Service press release when they were touting uh, this success, saying that, hey, there were only seven when we put it on, but there's 163,000 uh, plants today. And while that's true, it's not because there was actually any change in number of plants. They knew of seven. Subsequently, they discovered that the McGuire daisy and another daisy thought to be different were actually the same thing. And when you lump them together and you look harder for plants, you come up with a lot more. So it was removed from the list as a recovery. We go to the next one. <clears throat> on the left is something called the Island Night Lizard. Uh, it occurs on San Clemente Island, which is uh, a naval installation. Uh, San Clemente Islands off the coast of California. It's the Navy's only uh, active uh, shore bombardment area. And you've all seen pictures of it when you've seen pictures of Navy SEALs going through grueling training. That's where that occurs. Years ago, when uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service was adding the lizard to the list, uh, they were looking at three different populations of it. The one on San Clemente Island, and then uh, smaller populations on two neighboring islands. They recognized that you know, the, the population on San Clemente Island was pretty abundant. What they didn't quite, quite say is, and you can find in subsequent data, is that the habitat on San Clemente Island actually accounted for 90, over 99.8% of the lizard's habitat. In 2004, the Navy put forth a petition to delist uh, the lizard. And in that petition, the Navy uh, cited its own rough estimate that when the lizard was added to the list, there were already six to 10 million of them on San Clemente Island. By the time the Navy had petitioned for its delisting, there were, there were an estimated 21.3 million. Fish and Wildlife Service said, oh yeah, your, your petition may be warranted. And they got around to taking the uh, island night lizard off the list in a, a decade later. In, in 2014. And when they did, they were they required the Navy to uh, conduct post-delisting monitoring for another nine years because they did they do that regularly with any species that's recovered. So all these species that are inaccurately recovered actually cost more money than they have they had just been removed from the list uh, based on an honest assessment. Another lizard, one of my favorites, Manito gecko, uh, occurs on a little tiny uh, island, 37 acres, about 40 miles away from Puerto Rico. Some biologists went on there, 
uh, before the, the gecko was listed and they counted and they said, my gosh, we only see 18. Uh, but they did see a lot of black rats and they assumed, my gosh, all these black rats probably have been eating the gecko, causing it to have a significant population decline. Puerto Rico uh, Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources went out, eradicated the rats. Um, and around 2014, someone went out to count the lizards again. And while they were out there, I think they stayed, the, the team, it's an uninhabited island, difficult to access, sheer rock cliffs, uh, stayed out overnight, I believe. And while they were there in the evening, they noticed some geckos. And I, I think it, somebody realized or it dawned on them that, you know, geckos are quite often nocturnal. And all of the counts that have been conducted were in the day. And so uh, a year or two later, they came back out and conducted a nocturnal survey. And it turned out that they came up with an estimate of over 7,600 geckos. When they delisted the species, the service recognized that they have no evidence at all that a single gecko has ever been eaten by a rat. So basically, the species was assumed to be declining, assumed to be, uh, that decline was assumed to come from rats, and it was almost assuredly uh, a result of counting the gecko at the wrong time of day. Uh, but it was delisted in 2019 as a recovery. Uh, then we have the running buffalo clover. Uh, when it was listed, it was believed to be one of the, no the rarest species of North American flora and fauna. Uh, two different accounts I found. One said maybe four plants, another said seven. Uh, afterwards, uh, extensive surveys for the plant uh, have turned up 175 populations in, I believe, over 80 counties in six states, and one of the largest populations alone uh, totaled over 60,000. By no stretch of the imagination did it recover. Uh, we discovered more but it was declared, recovered in 1921. You go to the next one. Similar story quickly with a plant called Bradshaw's Lamentium. Uh, after it was listed, 10.8 million in one population were discovered on a privately owned golf course. And it was taken off the list and declared recovered in 2021. I know you probably haven't heard most of these species, but I'm guessing a lot of people have heard of the snail darter, which was one of the most, um, you know, it's in the pantheon of endangered species conflicts because it went all the way to the Supreme Court in a case called uh, TBAV Hill. And the concern was when a dam was built, it would inundate the single shallow moving water habitat of the snail. Uh, when you go through all the various fish and wildlife reports I've, I've read, you find that subsequently it's actually been identified in seven reservoirs, obviously impounded, uh, nine rivers, and three creeks. But again, 2022, uh, it's removed from the list as a successful recovery. And finally, the San, San Clemente sage sparrow uh, this species occurred in tandem with the lizard on San Clemente Island. Uh, when it was listed, it was thought to be something called the San Clemente sage sparrow. Uh, the integrated the taxonomic information system, uh, which is kind of the, the, the it's quasi-governmental because it's got some non-governmental partners in it, but Fish and Wildlife, NASA, EPA, uh, USDA, USDA um, are all members of maintaining this database that's spo to, supposed to have the authoritative information on species, what their scientific name is, to make sure it's unique. And if you go there, you'll find that the San, San Clemente sage sparrow is invalid. Uh, subsequently, the sage, San Clemente sage sparrow was believed to be the San Clemente bell sparrow. And if you check on it, as you will you will find that that's also considered invalid. It's actually uh, bell sparrow, uh, and it occurs on the west coast of the United States, and bell sparrow is considered uh, populist to the point that the International Union for, uh, of Conservation for Na Nature gives it its best rating, least concern 
And while the species was on there, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service was only looking at 15% of the island, which had a particular type of habitat, which they thought San Clemente Bell's sparrow only looked in. Then they noticed some sparrows decades later that were in other locations. And uh, they, after further surveys, came to find, you know what? The sparrow occurs on 90% of the island. And after they started conducting surveys covering 90% of the island, the number of sparrows doubled. But it was delisted in uh, 20, it's the most recent delisting in 2023. There are similar stories with species uh, supposedly recovered that are on uh, that have been proposed for delisting like the Puerto Rican tree boa uh, data show one opinion in a, an official wildlife service report that I recently read said that it's probably less abundant now than in pre-Columbian times basically the species was dramatically undercounted because it's cryptic it's hard to see and it hides <coughs> I believe boas have been found in 100% of the municipalities in Puerto Rico. It has been uh, proposed for delisting in 2022 as yet another recovery. And then you have, for example, uh, a California plant uh, that after listing, uh, you'll see a, a, an estimation of 10 million uh, was, was uh, derived and uh, you know the the understatement of the day that there may have been a gross underestimate when it was listed so all of these things are recoveries not really but that's that's what they are officially and this is a serious problem if you could go to the last slide 36 of 62 almost 60 percent well more than half of the things that we would expect to see, the things that the law is supposed to produce, are basically mistake, mistakes that have been camouflaged as recoveries. The same can be said basically of five of 12 of the currently proposed uh, species for delisting on the grounds of recovery. And the same can be said with the uh, reported improvement of about half the species that have been downlisted from endangered to threatened. So there's, there's more than twice as many species that, allow the, uh, that owe these improvements and delistings to bad data than to recovery. Now, you know, this is a small part of a critique of the ESA, but I think uh, a really important one because it reveals a serious scientific integrity problem. The agency knows this. Um, they're, they're, they're well aware of these facts and figures, yet they went through this regulatory process and they declared these things recovered when that really wasn't the case. You know, that's a problem. And it, it makes it so, so there's really less reason to trust on the front end when they're adding species to the list that that's going to be done with more integrity, right? Uh, it also misleads Congress and the public. You know, Congress has a job to oversee this. If, if the agency's uh, if Fish and Wildlife is presenting inaccurate information, um, how, are the, uh, agent, how are the congressional uh, oversight committees supposed to be aware of this? You know, they're supposed to trust the agencies. As um, Representative Newhouse said, you know, it was kind of a discovery that it wasn't, you know, three, four, five percent that had recovered, but it's really something in my, I would guess, closer to 1.6 to 1.7 percent. It's dramatically lower. And as I said before, some of those are really not um, impressive. And it misleads the public. I mean, they have an obligation to be honest with the public on what's going on with this law and if it's working well. And then it, it also uh, obscures waste of resources. I didn't get into it, but when these things are on, you know, the regulatory authorities of the act come into play. You know, people have been regulated under the Puerto Rican BOA. I think, you know, 20 years ago, there was a, uh, a developer of 300 low income housing units that was required to donate acreage for the BOA. 
and was required to pay for a study where they surgically implanted boas with transmitters and tracked them for a year. Um, maybe that's how they helped figure out the boa wasn't particularly rare, uh, but I don't think it should have been foisted on someone. That's the kind of data you try to gather before you make the decision to add the species to the list. And of course, the you know kind of the 800 pound gorilla in this analysis is that it obscures the serious problem of species listed based on bad, bad data. In no way uh, are these all the mistakes. There, in no way did all the species that were undercounted, um, their range was underestimated, their threats were overestimated, or they're taxonomically invalid, um, accounted for this for by this group that was removed from the list. There are more, uh, many, many more from where that came from. So with that, I hope I haven't killed you, uh, but we'll, we'll be happy to take questions. Just a few closing comments. Uh, Rob, thanks. You found the deceptive practice of misrepresenting mistakes as successes has gone on for decades. Hiding the waste of conservation resources and imposing regulatory burdens based on erroneous data. The effects of the ESA's implementation are consequential. Consequential to landowners and taxpayers who bear the burden of species listed based on insufficient and erroneous data or analysis. Species that are made later misleadingly claimed to have been recovered as well as other species that remain wrongly listed. Let's note that two thirds of the endangered species habitat is on private lands and the burden and expense mostly falls on the landowner. So, Looking forward, there are ways to make the ESA more efficient at recovering endangered species, such as greater transparency of data and utilizing the best data available, empowering the states over federal bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., and implementing adaptive management programs are just a few options. Again, these aren't rollbacks. These are improvements to protect species, but will also make the act friendlier towards local and state conservation efforts, as well as business business owners, property owners, farmers, and ranchers. Updating the ESA and congressional oversight can turn ESA failures and falsehoods into successes for truly endangered or threatened species. Appreciate you all coming here, and thank you for listening to us today. And uh, Rob's here to take any questions on the study.